disregarding rules, thoughtlessness, lack of knowledge. Each year, acts like these cause thousands of chemical-related injuries and illnesses. Chemicals are dangerous, but handling chemicals can be safe if you know what you're working with and if you take the proper precautions. Hello, I'm Dave Brown for Teletrain. Today we're going to give you eight rules or guidelines for handling hazardous chemicals safely. Along the way, we're going to show you why these guidelines are so important. Once you know something about chemistry and about how the human body can be harmed by chemicals, you'll see why following good safety practices and thinking before you act can save your health, and even save your life. Rule number one is make sure that the chemical you are working with is the correct chemical. Now that may seem obvious, but many injuries occur because people are in too much of a hurry to check a label carefully. This hydrochloric acid looks the same as this sulfuric acid. 56% acetic acid looks like 100% acetic acid but confusing them could lead to a catastrophe. Be absolutely certain you have the right chemical of the right strength. Then you must determine the nature and degree of any hazard the substance may present. How can it harm you? Is it a poison? How toxic is it? Is it flammable? Will it explode? Will it irritate your lungs? Will it burn your skin? Here again, the label on the container is a very important tool. Recognize this? It's the international symbol for poison. When you see it on a substance, make sure you understand the dangers. Labels will usually tell you how a chemical can be harmful, but precaution should be taken when using it. And what to do if you or someone you work with is accidentally exposed to it? read the label and read it before an accident happens. Department of Transportation or DOT labels tell you if a chemical is a flammable, a corrosive, an oxidizer, or another type of hazard. The specific chemical may also be identified by a UN number such as 1090 for chlorine or 1049 for hydrogen. One place you can find these numbers is in the DOT Emergency Response Guidebook. If you handle chemicals labeled with these numbers, it is important to know which chemicals they represent. On this NFPA label, the numbers 0 through 4 indicate low to very high hazard under emergency conditions. When the number appears in this blue area, it indicates the degree of health hazard. Red the fire hazard. And in the yellow area, it tells you exactly how likely the substance is to produce a dangerous chemical reaction. The white or colorless area provides special information. For example, a W with a horizontal line through it tells you that the chemical will react violently with water. With one glance, emergency personnel can tell what hazards to expect from burning or leaking chemicals and what procedures to use or avoid. There are many kinds of labels, and they may not all tell you exactly the same thing in the same way. If you see a label you don't understand, find out what it means before you use the chemical. Now what if there is no label, and no placard or process sheet, or anything else to tell you what a chemical is? Unless you just drew the chemical for your immediate use during your shift, whoa, stop right there. Never use an unknown substance. And when you draw a chemical for your own use, it should be labeled in some way, so you won't mistake it for something else. A label is not the only source of information about a chemical. You can find out a lot about a substance and how to handle it from one of these. It's called a Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS. Material Safety Data Sheets are written by chemical manufacturers and importers. They contain all kinds of facts or data 
relating to the safe use of the material by anyone in any situation. Some will contain more information than others. They will all list an emergency phone number for additional information about a substance and about emergency procedures. Sometimes using that telephone number quickly can save a life. If a product has more than one name, the material safety data sheet will tell you. It can also tell you in which family or group of chemicals a substance belongs. These family names can provide useful clues about how a chemical will behave. For example, if you see the word alkali, like this, the substance is a corrosive that will irritate or burn your skin and eyes. If you know that a chemical belongs to the alcohol family, you can be pretty sure it will catch on fire. All right, once you're certain that you have the right chemical and you determine what its hazards are, then what? Then you've got to isolate the hazard as much as possible. If the hazard involves a chemical reaction like fire or explosion, keep the substance away from other chemicals or heat or anything that will make it react when you don't want it to. If it's a health hazard, keep the chemical away from your body. Avoid any unnecessary contact or exposure and use the proper protective equipment. Remember, the wrong protection can often be worse than none at all. You must match the protection to the hazard. If you think you're safe when you're not, you could actually increase your chances of exposure. You might feel safe using this dust respirator, for example. But if the situation requires a chemical cartridge respirator, well, you could be slowly killing yourself. A false sense of security can be lethal. If you have any doubts about the protective equipment required by a particular substance, check the material safety data sheet. Now, even if you've got the right chemical, you understand its hazards, and you've taken the proper protective measures, you can still find yourself in a dangerous situation. Chemicals can change, and when they do, they can react in unexpected ways. They can do things you are not prepared for. Before you begin using a chemical, make sure it has not changed in either strength or composition. How can you tell? Well, it's sometimes very difficult, but a chemical's appearance and odor can often provide clues. The physical data section of an MSDS will tell you what a chemical's physical characteristic should be. You should never take a big whiff of a chemical. But if you happen to notice an odor different from one you're used to, or completely different from the one on the MSDS, don't use the chemical. Find out what the problem is. The same is true if the chemical looks unusual, if its color or thickness don't seem correct. And if you notice anything unusual about the container, such as crystals forming about the lid, leave it alone and notify your supervisor. There are reasons that chemical substances undergo changes. These are four of the most common. Age, evaporation, temperature, and contamination. As we're about to see, in different ways, they can each create potentially dangerous situations. Many chemicals change over a period of time. Often they become weaker, but there are some that can become highly unstable. These crystals could mean that the chemical in this bottle has formed peroxides while it was sitting on the shelf. Just touching the bottle might cause an explosion. It has happened. In an open container, or a container that is not very tightly sealed, a liquid will evaporate. That's why a can of paint you opened last year just dried up and left behind a blob of concentrated pigments. Over a period of time, liquids will change to a gas or vapor and disappear into the atmosphere. If a substance is a mixture like paint, as any liquids in it evaporate, the substance will change. If it is exposed to the air for a long enough time on a shelf or under a bench, the substance might change enough to cause an unexpected reaction. That's one reason why, when you are drawing a chemical, you should never draw more than one day's supply, and you should keep it in an approved container. 
Extremes of temperature can also cause chemicals to change. Nearly all chemicals should be stored in a cool, dry place because heat speeds up evaporation and chemical reactions. When the temperature gets high enough, many chemicals will react violently. They could even explode. Now, while it's true that cool temperatures slow down reactions, they can cause other problems. Some chemicals freeze at temperatures well above 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. And when they do, you must take special precautions. Consult the MSDS for the proper thawing procedure. It will almost certainly tell you that applying intense heat directly to the chemical is extremely dangerous and never use a chemical until it has been completely and properly thawed. Now let me tell you something that many people don't realize. It's possible for a very small amount of one chemical to change the behavior of another. If you've had one chemical in a container and then use that container for a different chemical without properly cleaning or purging the container, you'll not only contaminate the chemical, you could cause an unwanted reaction. Sometimes just the vapors left in a container are enough to do it. So make sure your container is ready for a new chemical. If you are using a small amount of a chemical to get a job done, never pour it back into its original container. It could easily contaminate the whole batch. And never pour it down the drain either. Use only your company's approved methods of disposal. All right, now let's see how evaporation, temperature changes, and chemical reactions can create hazards even when the correct chemicals are being used in a routine process. Hazards can be present even when a chemical is behaving normally. The way to avoid them is to know what the chemical is going to do and be prepared. We've set up this demonstration to show you that some liquids evaporate faster than others. These numbers, their evaporation rates, can be found on their material safety data sheets. Now, as you can see, the higher the number, the faster the liquid evaporates, which means that more of its vapors are entering the air. If you work around liquids, especially those with fast evaporation rates, remember they don't just disappear, you could be breathing them on hand only what you need and make sure you are properly protected. When a liquid boils, you can be faced with a similar situation. The substance is entering the atmosphere very quickly. But when a mixture of more than one liquid is heated, you can encounter a special hazard. This one contains water with a boiling point of 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius and hydrochloric acid which, as you can see from its MSDS, boils at a lower temperature, 207 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 97 degrees Celsius. We're going to use this pH paper to demonstrate the hazard for you. The paper turns red in the presence of an acid. Now watch. As the mixture begins to boil, and we test the vapor, the paper turns dark red because the hydrochloric acid with the lower boiling point is boiling off first. These vapors contain a high concentration of hydrochloric acid. You would not want to get in their path. Now, one more thing about the effects of temperature. Vapors and gases have pressure. If they are confined in a container and heated, they will expand. The pressure will build. And if there is no way for them to escape, they could cause an explosion. If you work with volatile liquids, liquids that release vapors easily, use a safety can with a vented cap to allow vapors to escape if the pressure becomes too great. Let's take a look at rule number six again. Know what a chemical is going to do. When it comes to chemical reactions, it's important in two ways. First, you've got to know how to work with your chemicals correctly. If you add acid to water, for example, Expect the water to heat up. Knowing that, you can make sure the heat won't damage any equipment or start any unwanted reactions with nearby chemicals. You'll know to add the acid slowly, stirring the water to spread the heat throughout the water and lessen the chance of overheating. 
and you'll know never to add water to the acid. And second, if you understand the process, you'll know when something is going wrong. If your process bubbles, sizzles, separates into layers when it's not supposed to, stop and attempt to discover the problem. So far, we've spoken about labels and material safety data sheets, but not all chemicals come in containers. Some are a natural part of a process or reaction. Many of them are invisible. You should know what operations are being performed around you and know something about the substances being used or created. Know how to spot conditions that could lead to hazardous situations. If you work around mechanical operations, such as grinding, mixing, dumping, or sandblasting, expect dust. Particles may be too small to see, but they're there. And the smaller the chemical particle, the more easily it will get into your body, and more of a fire or explosion hazard it can come. If conditions are just right, plain old kitchen flour can explode. Expect fumes around welding, brazing, and some soldering operations. Bubbles, a gas is being given off. If it's hydrogen, you've not only got a fire hazard, it will react with certain metals such as antimony or arsenic to form toxic gases. If you work around sulfur compounds or near sewers, watch out for hydrogen sulfide gas. It's flammable and toxic. To help you know where you might find a gas or a vapor that you may not be able to see, the MSDS lists its vapor density. Vapor density compares the weight of a gas to the weight of air. Some gases, like acetylene, methane, and hydrogen, are lighter than air and will rise. Others, like hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and propane, and most solvent vapors, are heavier than air and will settle. You'll find gases like these with a vapor density greater than one in pits, along floors, in sewers, and ditches. Think before you enter an area where these gases might settle. They take the place of the air that was originally there. If the gas level is over your head, there won't be any air left for you to breathe. Now, what if an accident does happen to you or someone nearby? You must be thoroughly familiar with emergency procedures and emergency facilities. Know your local emergency numbers, including the Poison Control Center hotline. And don't forget about the emergency number on a chemical's MSDS. If you've been trained in first aid or firefighting, do your best until medical or emergency help arrives. Providing them with a copy of the appropriate MSDS can sometimes save a victim's life. Know the location and proper use of your emergency showers, eye washes, respirators, fire extinguishers, alarms, telephones, and exits. Be able to find those with your eyes closed. You may have to sometime. By taking the proper precautions and staying alert, you should be able to control most potential chemical hazards and keep them from ever harming you. Even if an accident does occur, acting immediately and correctly can prevent major injury. Read labels, consult material safety data sheets, and understand the chemicals you're working with. I'm Dave Brown for Teletrain.